Section 14 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Katina Papadakis. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. Superstitious Dealings with Animals. Part 1. 1. Rats and Mice as Avengers. When in ancient times fields were overrun and crops destroyed by swarms of pestiferous animals or insects, these creatures were regarded either as agents of the devil or as being themselves veritable demons. We learn, moreover, that rats and mice were formerly a special objects of superstition, and that their actions were carefully noted as auguries of good or evil. A rabbinical myth says that the rat and the hog were created by Noah as scavengers of the ark, but the rat becoming a nuisance, the patriarch evoked a cat from the lion's nose. In the Horopolon, the only ancient work now known which attempted to explain Egyptian hieroglyphics, the rat is represented as a symbol of destruction. But the Egyptians also regarded this animal as a type of good judgment, because, when afforded the choice of several pieces of bread, he always selects the best. According to an early legend, the Tukri, or founders of the Trojan race, on leaving the island of Crete to found a colony elsewhere, were instructed by an oracle to choose as a residence that place where they should first be attacked by the aborigines of the country. On encamping for the night, a swarm of mice appeared and gnawed the leather thongs of their armor, and accordingly they made that spot their home and erected a temple to Apollo Smintheus this title being derived from the word meaning a rat in the Aeolic dialect. In ancient Troas, mice were objects of worship, and the Greek writer Heraclides Ponticus said that they were held especially sacred at Crisa, a town famous for its temple of Apollo. At Hamaxitus, too, mice were fed at the public expense. Herodotus relates, on the authority of certain priests, that when in the year B.C. 699 Egypt was invaded by an Assyrian army under Sennacherib, it was revealed in a vision to the Egyptian king, Sethon, that he should receive assistance from the gods, and on the eve of an expected battle the camp of the Assyrians was attacked by a legion of field mice, who destroyed their quivers and bows, so that, being without serviceable weapons, the invaders fled in dismay on the ensuing morning. And in memory of this fabulous event, a stone statue of King Sethon, bearing a mouse in his hand, was erected in the temple of Vulcan at Memphis, with this inscription, Whoever looks on me, let him revere the gods. Cicero, in his treatise on divination, while commenting on the absurdity of the prevalent beliefs in prodigies, remarked that, if reliance were to be placed in omens of this kind, he ought naturally to tremble for the safety of the commonwealth, because mice had recently nibbled a copy of Plato's Republic in his library. Pliny wrote that rats foretold the Marsian War, B.C. 89, by destroying silver shields and bucklers at Lavinium, an ancient city near Rome, and that they also prognosticated the death of the Roman general Carbo by eating his hose garters and shoestrings at Clusium, the modern Cusi, in Etruria. The same writer, in the eighth book of his Natural History, devotes a short chapter to an enumeration of instances, fabulous or historical, in which the inhabitants of several cities of the Roman Empire were driven from their homes by noxious animals, reptiles, and insects. He states on the authority of the Greek moralist Theophrastus, B.C. 372-287, that the natives of the island of Giaros, one of the Cyclades, were forced to abandon their homes owing to the ravages of rats and mice, which devoured everything they could find, even including iron substances. When the Philistines took the Ark of the Lord from the camp of the Israelites, as recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 4, a plague of mice was sent to devastate their lands, whereupon the Philistines returned the Ark, together with a trespass offering, which included five golden mice as an atonement for their sacrilegious act. In medieval legendary lore, rats figure not unfrequently as avengers. The Polish king, Popiel II, who ascended the throne in the year 820, rendered himself obnoxious to his subjects by his immorality and tyranny, and according to tradition, heaven sent against him a multitude of rats, which pursued him constantly. 
the king and his family sought refuge in a castle situated on an island in the middle of Lake Goplo, on the Prussian frontier. But the rats finally invaded this stronghold and devoured the king and all belonging to him. Again, in the year 970, so runs the legend, Haddo II, Archbishop of Mainz, who had made himself hateful to his people on account of his avarice and cruelty during a season of famine, was informed by one of his servants that a vast multitude of rats were advancing along the roads leading to the palace. The bishop betook himself at once to a tower in the middle of the Rhine, near Bingen, still known as the Mouse Tower, where he sought safety from his pursuers. But the rats swam out to the tower, gnawed through its walls, and devoured him. We read also, in a chronicle of the kings of England, that in the reign of William the Conqueror a great lord was attacked by mice at a banquet, and, though he were removed from land to sea and from sea to land again, the mice pursued him to his death. Rats and mice were not, however, the only agents employed as avengers. In the year 350, during a long siege of the Roman stronghold Nisibis in Mesopotamia by the Persian king Sapor II, the inhabitants besought their bishop, St. James, to utter a malediction against the enemy. Accordingly, the prelate, standing on one of the wall towers, prayed God that a host of flies might be sent to attack the Persians, and tradition has it that the prayer was answered at once. A multitude of the insects descended upon the besiegers, their horses and elephants, and men and animals, thus goaded to frenzy, were compelled to retreat, and so the siege was raised. The Philistines of old worshipped a special deity, Beelzebub, to whom they attributed the power of destroying flies. This same region is still infested with insect plagues, but the modern traveler who has no faith in Beelzebub is more likely to employ fly traps and energetic practical measures. Such are a few instances of the supernatural employment of vermin and insects as instruments of vengeance, and we need hardly wonder that, conversely, people in olden times should avail themselves of supernatural methods in order to protect themselves or their property from the ravages of these noxious creatures. In Mexico, rats were anciently the objects of superstitious regard, for they were credited with possessing a keen insight into the characters of all members of a household, and were wont publicly to announce flagrant breaches of morality on the part of such members by gnawing various articles of domestic furniture, such as mats and baskets. It does not appear, however, that the rodents were sagacious enough to indicate the individual whose conduct had aroused their displeasure. The Mexicans also had a superstition that whoever partook of food which had been gnawed by rats would be falsely accused of some wrongdoing. 2. Spirits assume the forms of black animals. The belief in the demoniacal possession of animals was prevalent in Europe for several centuries and in order to drive away the evil spirits, it was customary to employ various exorcisms and incantations, which were supposed to be infallible after approval by ecclesiastical authority. Reginald Scott, in his Discovery of Witchcraft, says that, according to the testimony of reliable authors, spirits were wont to take the forms of animals, and especially of horses, dogs, swine, goats, and hares. They also appeared in the guise of crows and owls but took the most delight in the likenesses of snakes and dragons. Bewitched animals were usually of a black color. A black cat is the traditional companion or familiar of witches the world over, and the black dog is also associated with sorcery in the folklore of some lands. Among the Slavs, the black demon Chernobog has this form, and the black hen is a common devil symbol in medieval witch lore. The gypsies believe, moreover, that black horses are gifted with a supernatural sight, which enables them to see beings invisible to the eye of man. Black animals figure prominently in many legends of the Dark Ages. Thus, the devil, in the form of a black horse, disturbed a congregation, which had gathered to listen to a sermon delivered by St. Peter of Verona in the 13th century, but was put to flight by the sign of the cross. Among birds, the crow is considered an ominous creature in some countries, and in northeast Scotland is always associated with the black art. The raven, too, is traditionally portentous, and is sometimes called the devil's bird. Its plumage is said to have been changed from white to black on account of its disobedience. 
In Swedish legend, the magpie shares the evil reputation of the raven and crow, and is characterized as a mystic bird, a downright witch's bird, belonging to the devil and the other powers of the night. The Kyrgyz, a nomadic people of Turkestan, are very superstitious in regard to the magpie, and note with care the direction whence the sound of its cry is heard. If from the north it portends evil, from the south a remarkable occurrence, from the east it denotes the coming of guests, and from the west a journey. The Reverend Alexander Stewart, in his Nether Lochaber, deprecates as unreasonable the universal distrust of the magpie. It seems probably that this is due less to its color than to certain other characteristics, for the magpie is a confirmed mimic and kleptomaniac, and of exceeding slyness withal. Apropos of crows as foreboders, whether of good or evil, an amusing story is told of a man who wished to test for himself the truth or falsity of a popular belief that seeing a couple of crows in the early morning is a sign of good luck. He therefore directed his servant to awaken him at daybreak whenever two crows were to be seen. Accordingly, one morning the servant called him, but in the meantime one of the birds had flown away. Thereupon the master became angry and gave his servant a sound beating, upbraiding him with having delayed until but one crow remained. The servant, however, nothing daunted, replied, "'Lo, sir, have you not seen the luck which has come to me from seeing two crows?' Superstition has been defined as a belief not in accordance with the facts, but this is manifestly incorrect. An ignorant person who thinks that black cats are more evil-minded than white ones thereby cherishes a mistaken idea, but is not necessarily superstitious. If, however, he believes that a black cat or any other animal is endowed with a supernatural faculty of exerting evil influences over human beings, then he is not only ignorant, but also superstitious. 3. Exorcism and Conjuration of Vermin The Grecian husbandmen were accustomed to drive away mice by writing them a message on a piece of paper and sticking it on a stone in the infested field. A specimen of such a message, beginning with an adjuration and concluding with a threat, is to be found in the Geoponica, a Grecian agricultural treatise. In the endeavor to justify the employment of radical measures against vermin, some curious questions of casuistry were involved. Rats and mice being God's creatures, one ought not to take their lives, but it was considered entirely proper to drive them off one's own domain, while recommending as preferable the well-stocked cellar of a neighbor. Formulae of exorcism, or sentences containing warnings to depart, were written on scraps of paper, which were then well greased and rolled into little balls, or wrapped about poisoned edibles, and placed in the rat holes. Conjurations of vermin were usually in the name of St. Gertrude, the first abbess of Nouvelle in Belgium, and also the patron saint of travelers and cats, and protectress against the ravages of the smaller rodents. The Spanish ecclesiastic, Martin Aspilqueta, surnamed Navarre, stated that when rats were exercised, it was customary to banish them formally from the territory of Spain, and the creatures would then proceed to the seashore and swim to some remote island where they made their home. The public records of Hameln, in the kingdom of Hanover, state that in the year 1284 a stranger, in gay and fantastic attire, visited the town and proclaimed himself a professional rat-catcher, offering for a consideration to rid the place of the vermin which infested it. The townsfolk having agreed to his proposal, the stranger began to play a tune upon his pipe, whereupon the rats emerged in swarms from their hiding places and followed him to the river Visser, where they were all drowned. The people of Hamel now repented of their bargain and refused to pay the full amount agreed upon, for the alleged reason that the rats had been driven away by the aid of sorcery. In revenge for this, the piper played the same tune on the next day, and immediately all the children of the town followed him to a cavern in the side of a neighboring hill, called the Koppenberg. The piper and the children entered the cavern, which closed after them, and in remembrance of this tragic event several memorials are to be seen in Hameln. Indeed, some writers maintain that the legend has an historical foundation, and such appears to have been the opinion of the townspeople, 
inasmuch as for years afterwards public and legal documents were dated from the mournful occurrence. An old tradition says that mice originally fell upon the earth from the clouds during a thunderstorm, and hence these animals are emblematic of storms. They are also mystical creatures, and have a relationship with Donar, Woden, and Frigg. In Bavaria, profanity is thought to increase the number of mice in a dwelling, and their appearance in the fields in large numbers indicates war, pestilence, or famine. Bohemian peasants are wont to make a certain provision for these elfish rodents. On Christmas Eve and on the first holiday of the year, whatever food remains from the midday meal is thrown upon the barn floor, and the following sentence is repeated. O oh, mice, eat these remnants and leave the grain in peace. On Christmas Eve, also, peas are placed in heaps, shaped like a cross, in the four corners of a mouse-infested room, lest the vermin get the upper hand and the premises be overrun. In eastern Prussia, when the harvest is gathered, the last sheaf of corn is left standing in the field, while the peasants surround it and sing a hymn as an incantation against future devastation of their lands by rats or mice. Or, when the corn is harvested, three inverted sheaves are fixed upon the barn floor for a like purpose. According to a Bohemian legend, the mouse was originally a creation of the devil, at the time when Noah entered the ark, attended by the members of his family and followed by a numerous retinue of animals. The devil, so runs the tale, hated the patriarch for his piety, and with evil intent created the mouse, whom he sent to gnaw a hole in the side of the ark through which the water might enter. But God then created the cat, who pursued and devoured the mouse, thus frustrating the design of the evil one. At the siege of Angiers, the ancient capital of Anjou, in the year 845, during the reign of King Charles the Bald, the French were much annoyed by swarms of grasshoppers of unusual size. They were duly exercised according to the custom of the times, and having been put to flight, are reported to have precipitated themselves into a river. The French writer saint foy in his Essai historique sur Paris, has recorded that in the year 1120, the Bishop of Lyon, in the department of Aisne, pronounced an injunction against field mice on account of their ravages, and Saint Bernard, a contemporary of that prelate, while preaching at Foigny in the same diocese, in order to relieve his congregation of the annoyance caused by a multitude of flies, repeated a formula of excommunication against them, whereat, according to monkish records, the flies fell dead in heaps and were gathered up with shovels. The early Anglo-Saxons not only made use of amulets of wood or other material, on which were engraven runic characters, to secure protection from elves and demons, but they carried about with them the herb called periwinkle, of the botanical genus Vinca, as a charm against snakes and wild animals. 4. Charms Against Animals As illustrative of the superstitious use of charms and exorcisms against animals and reptiles in different epochs and countries, we have examples from many and varied sources. The Egyptians used, as charms against venomous serpents, various magic formulae inscribed upon strips of papyrus, which were rolled up and worn as talismans. A specimen of such a one is to be seen among the Egyptian manuscripts in the Louvre collection. The following is a translation of a portion of one of these incantations, which invokes the aid of a god to protect the bearer against wild animals and reptiles. Come to me, O Lord of gods, drive far from me the lions coming from the earth, the crocodiles issuing from the river, the mouth of all biting reptiles coming out of their holes. Pliny recommended a particular herb as an amulet against serpents and vipers. This herb, to which he gives no less than five Latin names, appears to be identical with the Ancusa officinalis of modern pharmacopias, the bugloss or ox tongue of southern Europe, a plant now seldom used in therapeutics. The Grecians also were doubtless addicted to the superstitious use of charms against animals, although there is good authority for the statement that the citizens of ancient Athens did not hesitate on occasion to accelerate the flight of ominous creatures, as cats and the like, by throwing stones or other handy missiles at them in the night, 
a method wholly mundane and natural. And in this connection we may quote the opinion of the Reverend Father Pierre Lebrun in his Histoire Critique des Pratiques Superstitieuses, Amsterdam, 1733. The learned writer remarks that, if it were desired to drive a strange dog out of one's room, it would be quite unsuitable to begin with prayer in the use of holy water. One should rather first open the door and take hold of a stick, or throw some food outside, and if these and other practical measures fail, then recourse may be had to supernatural expedients, provided these have ecclesiastical sanction. In a treatise against superstition by a French savant, Martin of Arles, published in 1650, it was stated that the friars of the monastery of Ardennes were wont to boast that no rats could thrive in their neighborhood, and that this fact was due to the merits of St. Ulrich, Bishop of Augsburg, some of whose relics were deposited in their church. In this monastery also it had been formerly customary to scatter crumbs of bread which had been blessed, in places infested by vermin, and the monks believed that this procedure either caused the death of the animals or frightened them away. Turingian houses are sometimes cleared of rats in the following manner. Before sunrise on Good Friday morning, the master of the house, barefooted and in his shirt sleeves, goes through every room blowing on a tiny whistle made out of the thigh bone of a rat's hind leg. Another curious method of expelling vermin from a dwelling is in vogue in some portions of the Austrian Empire. Before the dawn of a principal feast day, one must take an old shoe which has not been recently cleaned and lay it on the ground at a place where two roads cross. No word must meanwhile be spoken aloud, but a paternoster is to be silently repeated. The direction in which the shoe points indicates the course to be taken by the rats in their flight. In the village of Becklin, a few miles north of Prague, troublesome mice are thus dealt with. Very early on an Easter Sunday morning, before the bells have rung for the first mass, the peasant matron collects and fastens together all the house keys. Then she waits until the first stroke of the bell for high mass at noon, whereupon she proceeds to the cellar, meanwhile jingling the keys vigorously so long as the church bells ring. When they cease she retraces her steps, still rattling the keys, and these measures are believed to permanently frighten away the mice. Towards the middle of the seventeenth century, a great army of locusts invaded the fields in the neighborhood of the town of Mixco, in Guatemala. So numerous were they as for a time to obscure the light of the sun, and to break the branches of the trees whereon they clung, and they speedily devoured the corn and other crops. Moreover, they covered the highways and startled the traveling mules by their fluttering movements. By order of the magistrates, the people of the country assembled in the fields with trumpets and other instruments, in order to scare away the unwelcome visitors. Idols were brought out, especially pictures of the Virgin and of St. Nicholas Tolentine. From the country regions near and far came the Spanish farmers to the town of Mixco, with propitiatory offerings for the saint, and all brought with them loaves of bread to be blessed. These loaves they carried back to their farms, and either threw into their cornfields or buried beneath their hedges, hoping by this method to protect their crops from the locusts. The mountain ash, or rowan tree, the Scotch roan tree, is thought to have derived its name from the Latin word runa, an incantation, because of its employment in magical arts. Woe to the witch who is touched by a branch of this tree in the hand of a christened man. Much has been written concerning the folklore of the mountain ash, and it is indeed a powerful rival of the horseshoe in its talismanic virtues, though not as a luck-bringer. But for the protection of cattle from the incursions of witches, not even the horseshoe may assume to usurp the rowan's prestige. Branches of this favorite tree, when hung over the stalls of cows or wreathed about their horns, are potent to avert the evil glances or contact, whether of witches or malicious fairies and their efficacy is enhanced if the farmer is careful to repeat at regular intervals the following fervent petition. From witches and wizards, and long-tailed buzzards, and creeping things that run in hedge-bottoms, good Lord, deliver us. Jameson, in his Scottish Dictionary, remarks that this practice of twining the rowan about the horns of cows bears a certain resemblance to an ancient custom of the Romans in their palilia, or feast celebrated at the end of April, whose object was the preservation of the flocks. 
He says, The shepherd, in order to purify his sheep, was in the dusk of the evening to bedew the ground around them with a wet branch, then to adorn the fold with leaves and green branches, and to cover the door with garlands. In China, it is customary for the Taoist priests to perform certain magical rites on the completion of a new pigsty, and before the admission of the animals to their new quarters. An altar is erected in honor of the Chulan Tuti, or genie of pigsties, and the walls of the compartments of the sty are adorned with strips of red paper, upon which are Chinese characters signifying, Let the enemies of horses, cows, sheep, fowls, dogs, and pigs be appeased.